a little bit different look on your screen today. Uh, my name is Jeff Eccles. I'm joined here by my co-host, Catherine McPhail. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Hello. Catherine. It's okay. I answered it, Kevin, too. That's like... Yeah, I'm sorry. I anything. <laughs> I always dreamed of having a co-host named Kevin. <laughs> wow. Okay. We'll talk about that later, Jeff. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a deeper issue. <laughs> so welcome, Catherine. Thanks for joining me today. And thank you to all of you that are out there. I see John Kinney wins the uh, Crocheted Bathtub Award for first in today. As you're joining today from wherever you are, a reminder, we're streaming live to the Entree Architect Community Facebook group. We are also live on LinkedIn. We're live on YouTube and for our huge fan base on Twitch. We're live there too. Um, if you are on Facebook, this is just a reminder, because of the Facebook rules coming out of a private group, we don't get to see your names. Uh, Facebook won't allow us to pull your names out. So if you um, want to identify yourself with your name or your initials or whatever, that's helpful from the Facebook side. Everywhere else, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, we see your names as you comment. But welcome. Thanks for joining us. We've got a great show today, great guest today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation because you, most of you, all of you probably know who this guest is. You've probably read his books. Uh, if not, you need to, but we're going to get into that in just a minute. And Catherine and I want to remind you, that we want to get you into this conversation as much as possible. So as we go along, think about the questions that you have for our special guest today. We'll bring those up. We'll get those in front of in front of him, and we'll make you as as much a part of this conversation as we possibly can. What did I forget, Catherine? Anything? I think that's it. I think you covered it. Well, All you didn't right. say who our guest was yet. I didn't. I didn't. But I want to introduce him now. Okay. So with that, I am going to bring onto the screen um, someone that Simon Sinek called the top contender for the patron saint of entrepreneurs. Oh, How about that? From Simon I Sinek. I know all accurate. of you know who Simon Sinek is. Catherine, what do you think about that? Simon Sinek says he's the patron saint. Yeah. Well, by the, by the yeah, time sure. he was 35... He had started and sold two, two multi-million dollar companies. He's a former columnist for the Wall Street Journal and business makeover specialist for MSNBC. Today, he leads two multi-million dollar ventures where he researches and tests the formulas and systems that become the books that he's written. Okay, hold and on for a second, many Jeff. Of this is like a, books. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but this is like a, yeah. um, a game show. Which game show was it when they have to guess who the person is behind the curtain? <laughs> That's I don't know, but reminding it, me of. But anyway, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I, so I, um, I feel like I need a really skinny microphone <laughs> to, to be that game show host. Like this is really exciting. <laughs> We're going to see who it is in a minute. We're going to see. Well, well, why don't we bring him on? Because you know his books. Those skinny microphones, by the way. There you he's, go. Excellent. He's talk like that. Hey, how are you? Thanks for coming to the game show. We're about hey, to introduce so the cool. biggest tool on the planet. He's a multi-millionaire. He talks about his business all the time. He brags about himself. Here's the tool himself. <laughs> and here he is. There he I is. Like such a D bag. Like, like as you were introducing me, I was like, oh my God. Am I the biggest jerk ever? The, you know, it's a brag sheet. It's a brag sheet. No, he left out I, all the rest of the stuff you include in your books about how it was good, it was bad, it was good, it was bad. You know, yeah, so just, that's the just reality. Yeah, collectively. It, I I am all be, like you. I I don't I don't get the biggest stages like you do, but I like to speak from the stage as much as I can, and and it's always uncomfortable. Right when somebody yeah. introduces me, they they read the bio or whatever, and I go, "Oh my gosh, who wrote this?" Oh wait a minute, I did. I gave them, <laughs> I gave them this bio. Did Mike so, give you his bio, Jeff? Mike did I, give me his bio. It's right there on his website. It's and, it's, it's in the biggest font I could find, <laughs> and it says it says read this in like a godlike voice. Uh, and make sure you pause for applause at the end. And I, I didn't, I didn't hear you pause. And I, well, I interrupted him. Yeah, well, he Kat, was going to deliver it that Catherine's way. Sorry. Pause here in a minute. Yeah, yeah. I but, love, uh, I love all the folks from the Northeast. By the way, I say New Jersey, Brooklyn is here. I'm in New Jersey myself. So, <laughs> rock on. Well, you, you have a fan club. You're no stranger to the Entree Architect community. Obviously, you've been on the podcast with Mark at least twice that I can remember. Yeah. Uh, you've done at least one master class for the Entree Architect Academy. So you're no stranger to uh, to most of the people that will join us today. And so that I appreciate. And you know, for those of you that are out there listening, 
Um, Mike, of course, he's an author. He's written a number of books, which we'll get into in a minute, but he wrote Profit First, Clockwork, uh, The Pumpkin Plan, Fix This Next. Many of you have read these books. Uh, some of you have implemented his systems. Um, so with that, Mike, thanks. Even with the skinny Mike, thank you for being our special guest today. No, I appreciate it. I love the rapport you two have too. Like right, right from the beginning, there's jibs and jibes. Jeff, you're like, oh, I want to introduce my co-host, Kevin. Yep. And Catherine, you just no, rolled with the, whatever. Roll the punch. Like, That's one of my names. <laughs> one's my name. So uh, no, thank you for, for having me. I, I do appreciate this. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate you being here. And um, one of the things that I want to dig into um, I think there's this natural perception, you know, you're an author, you've got all of these books out there. Um, you know, there's, there's this perception of expertise and deservedly so, right? You have, you have the books you've been writing for, um, you know, what, close to 15 years now, I think, right. uh, w going back to the first book that you published. And, it, and of course, you are the patron saint of the entrepreneurs. <laughs> that's that's pretty heady. He said that. Uh, it's unbelievably generous. I just got to acknowledge that was extremely kind of Simon. We are friendly, but we're far from friends. Uh, sure, sure. But we both, he and I launched our first books together. I actually was meeting with him at his, he had a loft in New York City, and we were discussing. And, I, and he said he has this book called Start With Why. I'm like, oh, that. That's not going to work. I'm like, I got a better book called The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. <laughs> and uh, fast forward, um, I might have been mistaken about that. <laughs> that's, no, that, that, that that's, really, that's really funny. I mean, it, it's I can see that conversation going on. Um, and, and, you know, and, and when you have, even though that's a funny situation with Simon Sinek, my gosh, at one point he had the the most watched TED talk of all time. Yeah. It's been surpassed now, but, uh, he, you know, that was sort of in the early days of Ted and, and you have these book and books. And, um, so I think there's this natural perception, my gosh, here's this guy, right. And, and he's written these books and he's, um, you know, he's had these businesses that he's sold and he's got a couple of more things he's working on now. And he's, he keeps writing, this is a guy that's got it all figured out. And, mm. you know, our audience, uh, as you know, many small firm architects and, you know, as we broadcast now out to LinkedIn and, and to the other platforms, I'm sure there are lots of other small business owners and professional services people that are with us. Here's a guy, you know, the perception, the guy that has it all figured out. It wasn't always that way, was it? No, and, and I don't know. I don't think I have it all figured out. I, know. I, you know, the outward perception I think can be that way for many of us. Like I, it's funny as you're talking. I'm like, wow, you you all you have media figured out. Like I wish I knew what you were doing here. This this platform is amazing. I, I think I wish I knew what Catherine was doing because she's running the whole thing. Well, I love it. I, I think we have a you know a, a less than one percent perception of someone. And then we deem that as the person. So people hear the books I write and stuff or, or experience that. And thank you for, I see the kind words coming through Profit First. A Facebook user says Profit First saved my business. I mean, that touches my soul. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think the reason Profit First, for example, came about was I had no clues about finances. I have a myopic, uh, small view of finances now. It's been Profit First and it's it's been life transforming for me too. But some people are like, oh, this guy, he's clearly the financial expert. Like, you know, here, they, they flop down a, a cash flow statement and a balance sheet. They're like, can you, can you read this? And what should I do? And I'm like, I can't. I can't. That's why I made profit first. I, I think trying to translate this into a lesson is that I think our weaknesses are our strengths. The, the fact I'm not good at finance, even though I want it to be, forced me to find a system that would trick me into being good. And that's how profit first came about. I found that. I'm really, I really struggle with complicated concepts, but I'm able to find these little shortcuts or hacks that actually get me 90% of the way there anyway. And so maybe that's the perceived capability I have. And it's so like, oh, he's really good at something when it's just, I, I found a shortcut that works for me and I'm sharing it. I don't know if that makes you, sense. You, you know, you say that. And one of the things that I really appreciate about your books you know, and there, there is a question on the screen right now that we'll, we'll get to here in just a second, but selfishly, I want to say, um, 
the thing that I really appreciate about the books, and I've I've read uh, three of them, I believe. I haven't read all of them, but I've read three. Um, I, my perception, which is exactly the way you just said it, is that you have this innate ability to take these complex systems. And I completely understand that now where you're coming from, where you say, hey, I've got to... Fi- I've got to figure this out for myself. I'm looking for a hack for myself. Yeah. So then that's where these systems come from. And that's what I really appreciate about the books is I'm like you. I'm not I'm not the money guy. I'm not the numbers guy. Oh my gosh. You know, I read Profit First and you've boiled down this idea to a very very to maybe to its essence and then mm-hmm. built up simple systems on top of that. And so that that's that's been my perception of of the books that I've read. Uh, I remember I, I remember uh, a story about Steve Jobs and uh, if anyone listening in wants to google this one it's fascinating. So I'll do just a little trivia question. Um, you can you oh, can I cheat like on that. Google if you want. What what was the phobia Steve Jobs had? Oh, wow. Jeff or Catherine, do you know what it was? Wait, I, I have don't. to google it. <clears throat> yeah. It's a crazy <laughs> phobia. Know. And uh, uh, it, it, I'll give you bonus points if you can pronounce it, uh, the phobia. And just ow. just for expedience's sake, he had a phobia, yeah. a fear of buttons. And l- look it up. Just type mm, in Steve that Jobs. Makes fear sense. Of that makes sense. As in, like, that's like, why he wears like, a turtleneck, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, that's why. they freaked okay. him out. That makes so, sense. if you wonder why Steve Jobs was wearing a turtleneck, it's because it was button free and he wasn't wearing button fly jeans. The interesting <laughs> thing is he leveraged that weakness into his great strength. Steve Jobs uh, innovated the phone, right? So um, he saw the opportunity as the new computing platform, not being the PC anymore or clones. It was the phone. And BlackBerry, CrackBerry, dominated the space. The CrackBerries had, remember, if you had that, had a whole QWERTY keyboard on it. Like like you had to make your thumb act like it was a a needle somehow. (laughs) Well, the competition, I don't know if you remember the competition, they were making phones with more buttons because the obvious thing was to, compete you do better so they had to slide up like the, the screen would slide up and there's this mass right, yeah, yeah. right. but he hated buttons he hated buttons so steve ah. jobs said make a make a phone that's button free and the first button was embedded in there but as a result they blended technology and art they transformed the industry and iphone dominated the space and right. yes the android followed that path the lesson to me was oh my gosh what i struggle with is actually my opportunity my disadvantage is my greatest mm-hmm. advantage and for me, it's constantly, I struggle with attention and complex stuff. I, I It just buries me. But also, it frustrates me to the point where I got to find the hack. And I th- that's what I'm trying to do as an author. I love entrepreneurship. It is the coolest thing ever. Um, it's way too hard for me and too many people. And so I just endeavor to figure out the fixes for all the different pieces of entrepreneurship and just you know simplify it. Catherine, you want to uh, address, this is actually Christian's question, I believe. Someone else that wears turtlenecks because they hate their neck. Yeah, so I love it. Go. It's a double win, right? Yeah, no there's an opportunity there. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have to figure out what that is. So what am I reading? The Well, someone wanted to know if they had, if they were to read all of your books, would you suggest still reading all the books? Because I know in Profit First, you were saying nothing, you're saying just skip the toilet paper entrepreneur or what? what's your advice for people? Yeah. Your, so your, I, you know, answering that, I used to be whatever I was most enthusiastic about, but that is actually not a good move. Like I would say, oh, you got to refix this next. My current release. I love it. But what I found is the best book to read next is what your business needs from you next. Like what's the biggest challenge you have in your business at the moment? Endeavor to solve that. And I, admittedly, I may not have it. If, if you have a challenge with hiring people, sadly, I have not written that book yet. So I can't be of service, but there's amazing hiring books out there. Top grading comes to mind. Who? Um, scaling up by Vern Harnish. So what's the biggest challenge you have? And then deep dive into that. Um, I did write, coincidentally, Fix This Next, because a common challenge is trying to figure out what your challenge is. So many entrepreneurs actually don't know what the challenge is. We know all the fires we need to put out, but we don't know the one thing that's really going to move us forward. And the indicator of this is if you're trying to fix everything month in, month out, year in, year out, and you're not moving forward, you're not finding the one thing. So if you don't know what the one thing is, then I uh, may, if I may be so bold, I do suggest fix this next because that's a tool that'll help you find it. Okay, so fix this next is first. Fix this next first if you don't know what to do. Once you know what you need to do, go all in on that thing. 
that yeah. thing. But which of your other books? Like then, then should they read right. profit so, first? So or? clockwork, for example, is business efficiency. So mm -hmm. he, I'll, I'll give you some indicators. If if the business is dependent upon you, you have a business that's in real trouble because no one wants to buy that. So if you plan to retire on your business, selling your business, that ain't going to happen. And if you want to ever take a vacation or if you have a forced break from the business, like an illness or something, the whole business will collapse. Mm. Many entrepreneurs treat their business like they're conjoined with it. Like we're conjoined twins. You have to separate. And the separation is surgical and, and selective. That's what Clockwork teaches you how to extract yourself from the business so the business can run itself. Um, pumpkin plans about organic growth. How do you grow without having to plow money into it? That saying it takes money to make money is bullshit. Uh, uh, profit, uh, the pumpkin plan tells you how to navigate that. And then profit first is fiscal management to bring permanent profitability. Mike, so, what do, you, do you mind, Jeff, if I just ask about sole no, proprietors? Please. Because in reading your book, I keep thinking, well, I guess I'm just an employee and I own all the stock, right? Because as, as you were saying, because I'm a sole proprietor and so I'm not planning on selling my business, I don't think. Okay, good. Should I just not worry about it? I just continue on just... Well, I would argue you should still... You shouldn't worry about selling if you don't ever intend to sell, but you should, I would argue, worry about working in the business. You see, I think the misconstruction that sole proprietors have or their misperception about their business is that that means I'm the only one supporting the business, but that's not true. You have vendors, right? If you if you pay anyone money to do something to benefit the business, that is a team. So it may not be employees in the traditional sense. It could mm. be virtual help. It could be actual vendors and suppliers. Even the clients themselves can be employed in a certain capacity to do stuff for the business. Like, for example, uh, it used to be in the olden days, if you wanted to buy something, you had to go through a Sears catalog, find something, call up the attendant, and the, the operator would tell you to say your address repeatedly so they could enter it. Well, m fast forward to today's times, uh, you are doing the data entry. You are now the operator because you happily, you know, I happily type in my address. Oh, here it is again. Type it in for the hundredth <laughs> time this year, happily, so I can get my stuff. The, right. the responsibility of the work has actually been placed on me. So we can even develop systems. So a mm. pro sole proprietor does not mean sole dependence. We still have the responsibility to build systems and structure where there's very little dependence upon us. Okay. W one thing that I think is interesting, as I was thinking about this conversation today and, and you know, what, what are we going to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> someone says, so relaxing here, someone talks this fast. You wanted 1.8 and you got 1.8. Yeah, oh, I didn't even it, notice. You can bring it on. Bring it on, Mike. Yes, it on. I, I can't get the New Jersey out of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We love the New Jersey. And we and as you've seen, we've got some New Jersey uh New Jerseyites. What do you call what is someone from New we Jersey? We call ourselves TH uh Are you like Tas it Tasmanian Devils Hamming or something? Are there some <laughs> devils from New Jersey, aren't there? I don't know. I'm, yeah, New Jersey I'm, Devils is our team, oh, but we, we call ourselves the Taylor Ham Egg and Cheese State. That's only for northern New Jersey. <laughs> wow. Southern New Jersey get pissed at that. It's a whole thing. <laughs> Well, we don't want to start any civil wars within within the state <laughs> within of New Jersey, Jersey. The separation. <laughs> it, as I think about, mainly about the entre architect community, because this is where this conversation stems from, um, I was thinking about how do you categorize everybody that's part of this community? And so I kind of came up with four different categories. We've got uh, a number of folks that fall into, I'm just getting started on right. my own firm, on my own thing, or I'm getting ready to start my own thing. So that's one. Um, the second is um, I'm in growth mode or I want to grow, right? I've got a firm. I'm, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to go ahead. Maybe I want to hire, maybe I don't, but somehow I'm growing. I think there's a third category of people that are really satisfied with where they are. Um, I'm a sole proprietor, maybe, or I've got three people, maybe I don't want to get any bigger, whatever that is. It's we're sort of at a satisfied point. And then we also have folks that are maybe on the opposite end of the spectrum from the just getting started that are looking at whether it's very soon or maybe in the next few years, the secession plan in mm -hmm. whatever form that takes, whether it is actually selling or uh, passing it off to someone else, or just scaling back and and you know working into um, maybe maybe even a new role, right? I'm I'm thinking about um, I still want to I still want to kind of do this, but I want to do it in a different way, and I want it to be more relaxed or something like that. So that's probably the spectrum, I suppose, of of any sort of 
business environment, but how, especially on the front end, because I'm also looking out and saying, hey, there are a lot of people that are going out on their own, either yeah. because yeah. they planned or for survival. They may have gotten laid off, you know, with the economy the way it's it's been or something like that. So what, what's the what's the best tip for many of the books? Uh, best tips from Mike Michalowicz for somebody that's just getting started. Maybe they've opened up um, Fix This Next and they see some of the percentages and they see some of the the numbers in there and they go, holy, you know, I'm, right, right, I'm right. moonlighting right now, right? I can't even imagine. So what about somebody that's just getting started? What's the best advice for them? Yeah, I, I found on this curve that you laid out from startup to growth, you know, maturity, lifestyle, and uh, right, right. ultimately retirement, there's different actions. The startup phase is typically a sampling phase. You don't know what's going to work until you find what's working. So we can go in with the best laid plans and uh, sure enough, they don't come true. I, I can't tell you any business plans I've read that say, oh, you know, based upon our trajectory, we're going to do a hundred million dollars in the next three years. And they're lucky to do a hundred thousand dollars in the next three years. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason is, is a plan is based upon everything executing in sequence to achieve that goal. But the reality is there's so many variables, there's a lack of predictability. In fact, actually, if you could predict your business for three years, you probably could predict the stock market for one day. And if you could do that, you become a billionaire. So yeah. the reality is in our, in our business, in the early stages is sample. But this is, re realize you're in a lab experiment here. You have to analyze the results. Uh, of try to avoid your own biases. Evaluate the data. As you land clients, who is it resonating with? Who is it not? Where's your best profit margin? Where uh, do you get the most joy? Consider these elements. And then as you start taking on the next stage, which is growth, you actually start to refine down um, to target that market. The analogy I use is like doctors. Hopefully all of us here have a general practitioner that we see regularly. Um, but the, if you think about the general practitioner, the challenge she has is that when you go see her, um, she can do all the surface level diagnostics, but is constantly having to learn new things. Like you, two years ago, you didn't have to know about COVID. Now you have to know how to diagnose that someone has COVID. And uh, if you go to the general practitioner and you you are showing symptoms of something like this, you know, skin rash or something, if the cure isn't topical or something simple like an ointment, and she says, "Oh my gosh, I think that's an indicator of cancer." Mm -hmm then you have to get prioritized to a specialist. The interesting thing about the specialist is they are very deep in a very narrow area. So the general practitioner is broad, specialist is deep. The specialist knows how to cure or resolve that skin cancer problem. That's mm -hmm. all they do. Now, the way we perceive them as a consumer is different. The generalist, we do what's called convenience purchasing. Chances are, if you have a general practitioner, she or he is in the general area of where you live, Chances are they have a low copay based upon your insurance, 50, 60 bucks a visit or something. Now, if that general practitioner says, I'm moving out of state or I'm heading out of town, continue to visit me, forget it. It's inconvenient. Or if they say, you know, the copay for 25 bucks, it's really not working for either of us. I'm going to make it 25,000. We'd be like, uh, no, ha. Huh? But the specialist who goes very deep resolves skin cancer because it saves our lives. They can be anywhere on this planet. We will navigate to them. And a $25,000 copay, well, that's a deal. The lesson for our businesses is in the early stages, you got to be that general practitioner. And I'm saying this is usually under $250,000 in revenue in a service-based business like architecture. Then once you start getting a little bit of legs under you, where do you naturally have a capability? What kind of patients or clients are coming to you for what kind of need that you can solve very efficiently, effectively? That's in the growth stage. We start going very deep on that. That's where we become the specialist. And when you're the specialist, the community will seek you out and pay a premium, no brainer. The challenge is many businesses in the startup phase and the early growth stage try to stay a general practitioner way too long and then get frustrated. No one's willing to pay me a premium. Everyone's telling me to sharpen the pencil. Those are all indicators that you're still a general practitioner and not an elite specialist. That's a really interesting way to look at it. And I, and I always love the, you know, for all the architects out there that, that say, uh, you know, why, why aren't we respected as much as doctors, et cetera. And, you know, I, so I love it when we come up with the, the doctor examples because they're, um, many times they're very applicable. Yeah. The, um, 
you know, you mentioned two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue. How do you? So let's just say because we do have a number of people uh, as part of this community that are, um, you know, like I said, they're moonlighting right now. They might sure. be employed um, and then doing these other types of projects on the side. How do they set goals? How do they? How do they say okay? Well, Mike said at 250, I've got to, I've got to be specialized, right? So how do I transition from being an employee and how do I navigate this to the point of, okay, I've got to figure out what this specialty is? Yeah. So the 250 is a rule of thumb, right? It doesn't sure. apply to every business, but it is nice to have some basic guidance. I think in the moonlight phase, when you're about to go full-time, you have to take a hard, candid look at your lifestyle. At the end of the day, I call it lifestyle congruence. I actually do talk about this in, in the book, Fix This Next, but lifestyle congruence is an understanding of what you need to support your expectation of a lifestyle. There is a survival level, which is food on the table, shelter over our, our head. Uh, then there is a comfort style, which could be much more luxurious comfort overhead and much more luxurious meals. You have to define what you're willing to honestly do. And the transition point is can be going to a business that supports that survival mode or lifestyle mode. I will tell you this. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, parallels and I was studying surfers. I, as I was studying surfers, what I found is I'd never found a surfer, obviously, that can surf two waves simultaneously. But that's what I see businesses doing. It's like, well, I got this one job. I'm trying to launch my own company. I'm trying to surf two waves. You just can't. But what I did see surfers do, they call it dumping. They'll dump out on a wave because it's not riding as well as the next big one that's coming and they'll jump on the next one. I, I rarely see a smooth transition from a business uh, person that's employed to going to their full-time former moonlighting endeavor. It's going to be a bumpy transition. Sure. I'd invite you to put some cushioning in place. You know, that job you have, can you start scrolling away 10 or 20% of your income and start crunching down your lifestyle to more of a survival mode? So you build up a cache of cash, ironically, to, uh, to help you navigate that launch period. That may be something to do. But I've also found that there's something interesting when it comes to launching a business. And I found that many business owners seem to become the most effective when they actually don't have much runway. In the, especially in the early stages. It, when they have that cushion, it's much easier to make decisions like say, oh, that Facebook ad, everyone's telling me to run, it's not working, but let me try a little bit longer. But when that cash depletes, it's like, we can't make wrong decisions. We got to get this moving. So there may be an advantage of actually going in a little less prepared in some regards, because then you have to be much more coy. You have to be much more thoughtful. You have to act much stronger and be more courageous because we don't have as much time. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this. There just has to be a day you got to make the leap. And it is very tenuous to be looking over the cliff saying, oh, this is too scary to start my own business. Oh, I'm going to go back to the safety of a job. And then we say, oh, if I do this job one more year, I'm going to regret it. And we look over the cliff again and we go back. And there's a day will come where it's simply just going to be regret. It's going to be too late. I'd rather, I encourage people, make that entrepreneurial leap sooner rather than later. Because even if it fails, at least you won't live with the most dire consequence, which I believe is regret. That's that's a that's really great. that's a New Jersey guy talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's the the um, you know we get some comments and I see one right now. This is what does survival mode look like with with kids to support and those are the things that you have oh to. Boy, I can right? tell you all of what that looks like. <laughs> I've been oh, living I, that life for many years. I have three children, and uh, when I when I became an author. I, um, which is at least like any other business, uh, I believe, by the way, I'm selling a product. I'm selling the ultimate information product. The only thing is I make $4 a book, the true factual number, $4 and five cents. I, sorry, I was rounding down <laughs> $4 and five cents a book. I got to sell a lot of books to sustain what I think many people in the U S would consider just a modest lifestyle. Uh, and then to live a much greater lifestyle, I got to really ramp things up. It's a very risky move. The thing is, I, I have a, a technique. If you have kids, I said to myself, um, self, should I do this? And myself was saying no. But then I said, what would I tell my children? If my son or my daughter was going to start their own business, would I tell them, mm, don't, don't follow your heart, follow the money? No, I would tell my kids, go all in on what you believe. Because at the end of the day, it's about your service to humanity. It's about your happiness factor. And the money 
somehow, some way it will come if you pursue it and it'll support you in that endeavor, but go all in. And I realized as I was saying, I would say this, the greatest way to say a belief is to act it. My children watch me, watch what I do. You know, th they may listen to my words, but they know what I do. That's I am point. very good point. proud that I took the commitment. I made the commitment to pursue authorship 15 years ago and haven't stopped. I think it's been the greatest lesson for my kids. And even if it completely and abjectly failed, I feel it's still be the greatest lesson that I pursued what my heart called out to do. You, you know, you said something a minute ago about that, where, uh, and I think another perception, right? If, if someone's just perusing the bookshelves, the Mike McCallowitz bookshelves, to see uh, toilet paper <laughs> entrepreneur, <laughs> they, they see profit first, they yeah. see uh, clockwork, they see surge, they see the pumpkin um, plan, pumpkin plan. Yeah. they see fix this next. And on the surface, they may go, okay, well, these are really pretty straightforward this is how you do it business books. But one of the things that I appreciate, and one of the things that they're missing out. So any of you that that have been perusing the bookshelf, but not actually reading the books, I think one of the things you're missing out on is that you do talk a lot about balance and yeah. priorities. And, and you have your own version of, of Maslow's hierarchy of, of yeah. needs. And um, so it's, it's not, um, it's not this cutthroat isn't the right way to say it, but it's not this boom, this is business. There's more to it. Uh, you, you mentioned joy uh, a few minutes ago, and, and that's part of it as well for you. I um, There's some large, large, big names, pundits of the entrepreneurial uh, experience who say hustle and grind is everything. How bad do you want it? You got to push yourself. And uh, I want to tear out my my thinning hair because I'm like, uh, it, it's not, it, entrepreneurship has never been about hustle and grind. It's been about vision. It's been about organization. It's about identifying something that could serve others and then making it, manifesting it. I actually believe the biggest job of entrepreneurs is to be providers of jobs. There was a study conducted by uh, the SBA do you know 7% of all of the human population will ever start a company or invest in a business to the, that they ultimately operate? I mean, 7%, 93% of the population is looking for a good, reliable job. Therefore, our job is to provide jobs. So we have to get real clear with that. That's very interesting. And, and, That's surprising. Yeah, and, and I'm surprised it's so low. Yeah, me too. Me too. But because we're the, we're crazy. We are crazy. <laughs> That's it. Like, yeah. All oh, my friends you, are crazy too. That's we just all stick together, I guess. If you yeah, if you look at the data, Catherine, if you if you under you know if you look at the numbers, it is a massive risk. The vast majority of businesses fail. Okay, this is the part I'm not right. listening to, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. It. But 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 the nice thing is this: the one thing they don't account for is every one of us is making a bet on the most reliable person we can ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I trust no one. As much as I trust myself, True. and therefore, if we position ourselves in a way that gives us joy and energy and excitement, the odds of success are great. The risk we run is when we do something just to placate what we think the world wants. True. You know, this concept of pivoting drives me nuts too. Yeah. There's a concept out there that try to sell something to a customer. If they don't buy it, that means you have to change and pivot, adjust to sell again. And if that doesn't sell, pivot until ultimately people are buying. But the thing is, people pivot into a business that they loathe. I can't tell you how many entrepreneurs I've met that say, I hate my business, but now I'm beholden to it. I re I hate going to work. What, what kind of life is that? I think we don't need to pivot. We need to align. Hmm. It, it all boils down with we're betting on ourselves, and therefore, it, we really get to know ourselves. And when we know ourselves and what gives us satisfaction, drive, energy, and joy, align our business to serve that. And now the odds skyrocket for success. True. How do you get to know yourself though? Or is that a bigger question? Is that a totally I, different? That's show? a very private question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. I, I asked the hard questions, Mike. Yeah. So he, the, the, the number one way I found to get to understand myself is to try to experience variety, different things mm -hmm. to not be myopic. And that's the irony of a business. When we start a business, we need to be broad in experiencing things. I'm not saying open a one shop. We do everything start in a space that just feels right, but experience that. So I started off, for example, 
with setting up computers because that's what I knew. And I started doing it. It's like, mm, I like it. It's okay, but it's not giving me total joy. But then I found there was a facet of it. I started a new business around that's it. called computer forensics. That's computer crime investigation. Ooh, that was intriguing. You know, oh, that does sound we literally would sneak into buildings in in our uh, in in uniforms that we looked like janitorial crews, and we had the the garbage um, the the rolling garbage cans, and inside was all serious? our forensic equipment. What you would actually sneak into businesses with like dressed like a janitor? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So that's fun. Yeah, so I well, can see why you like that. I saw him yeah. in a movie one time. Wow. Yeah, so I was watching um, CSI that that computer show and the forensics show. And I was like, oh, that seems like fun. And so we said, I set up this business to experiment with it. And that was a great success. Um, it, it was a massive success for me and it was joyous. And then I, I asked myself, what did I learn from this? And it turned into another business and it turned into writing. I, I allowed myself to experience different things as I was building these businesses. But I did always ask one thing. I said, what's my purpose on this planet? And uh, I believe I found it. And I think it can be God-given or it can be self-given. I think it's our choice to define that. But for me, uh, my life's purpose is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. I realized as I went through this journey and continuing reflecting on it, I'm like, why am I here? I said, oh my gosh, many entrepreneurs, we set out to experience financial freedom and personal freedom. And that's the thing we don't experience, those two things. It's actually more struggle and, and financial strife. That gap I call entrepreneurial poverty. And I'm like, that's it. I got to fix this. I, I've only found that if I experimented in life a lot. Mm. Yeah. That's where that, you, you just have you to know, live I your think, life for a while. Yeah. And reflect on it. I, I can right. show you something. Hold on. Let's see. So this is um <laughs> this is a journal that I per, I've been writing. Uh, if you can see stuff in there. And what's interesting is it used to say success journal. I put tape over it because that's not at first i thought to, to find happiness we've got to write everything that we're successful at so i put mike's success journal and then i started realizing it's just writing down anything that comes to mind any thoughts and becoming very self-observant so i filled this out regularly and it was it was using this that i found oh my gosh this is something that really resonates with me i have to mm -hmm. resolve entrepreneurial poverty and, and by the way books are a vehicle for doing that it's not the pat the uh the purpose the purpose is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty but perhaps i could do that countless other ways i i've just decided that books is the vehicle i'm using for now and, and for the foreseeable future yeah writing writing really helps me figure out what i want what i actually want you know if i write every morning a little bit it, it, it's beautiful i yeah. talking about writing um so so yeah i call this journaling it's, it's a guy's word for diary it's a diary um no I know. It's, a it, it's a great, it's the cheapest and most effective form of psychiatric help. I'll, t I'll tell you that. It's true. I've also found having a deliberate ritual or process for me, particularly in the morning has been a great structure to, to advancing what I want to advance. So I, I want to get better at playing guitar. There's my guitars over there. I, every morning, five 30 in the morning, I'm up playing guitar quietly nice. your family uh, like that six o'clock i'm writing my books six to seven seven to eight I'm, I'm exercising and then i'm off to start the day but by by making that such a regular habit i've accomplished more since i've established those habits than than i've ever before mm. yeah I, I like that you, you know it's I, I, there are people that will push back well i don't i don't like to be so regimented but yeah you know that sure. in my mind I don't that's like to get up so early <laughs> well, there's there's that. Um, They're missing but, a lot, not getting up at 5 a.m. and doing stuff like that. You are You're missing a quiet house. Yeah, yeah a quiet house. And, and to me, before dawn, that's like the extra time. It's like the gift of time that I get before the sun mm. rises. I don't know why I think of it that way, but. But, but it's not for everybody. You know, I, I, I read, uh, you know, what the hundred most successful people on the planet do. And I read them like, OK, if I just copy all their stuff. But I realized I, I have to, I should only copy the elements that resonate with me. I, I think as I look at life, there's common threads that I see that say, oh, that can be stitched into my lifestyle. I, the morning thing works for me. Maybe for some folks, any form of ritual is probably the worst thing. Anything that's that systematized, it may destroy their creativity. Um, so I think we got to resonate with, you know, land, do what resonates with us. Yeah. That's a really interesting point, though. And, and I've heard versions of that before, you know, well, 
you know, the, the systems stifle my creativity, et cetera. And, uh, you, you know, my problem with a statement like that is that's the problem with your business. You're trying to be creative with everything all the time, which means that you're recreating the wheel all the time. And it's the, the lack of repeatable systems and processes that's hurting you. Um, if you have those things in place, that gives you more time. It gives you more freedom to be creative and do the things that you want to do. That That's my take on that. I, I agree. And you, right, structure can, can bring freedom because was it that old uh, analogy? There was a professor in front of the classroom and he says, uh, here's the the elements of life. There's big rocks. These are the biggest challenges. Medium sized rocks are you know the the things that throw you off. And then sand, which is everything else. Oh, he filled yeah, yeah. the jar with sand first, and he said, "Look, oh, there's no yeah. room for the rocks." But when he did the big rocks first, mm -hmm. and then he did the medium sized rocks, then he could add the sand. It all fit in. the The point was many of us are focusing on the minutia, and when there's no mm -hmm. structure or systems, the minutia grabs our attention. When when we focus on the big rocks, that's what I'm doing in the morning. In the morning, writing books and, and ex physical mm -hmm. exercise is critical to me. I know that's the big rocks of my life. Mm -hmm. Someone asked what time I go to bed. By the way, eight o'clock. I'm in bed. Nine o'clock sleep. Wow. So oh, eight o'clock okay. in bed, and I you know I'm reading the paper. That's bullshit with my wife. And then nine o'clock lights out. Yeah. That's yeah, like a, the, a I don't know where. I don't know where the rocks and sand analogy originally comes from, but uh, Gino Wickman uses it a lot in traction. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. For, for the uh, the EOS people that are. Uh, paying attention to entrepreneurial, was it entrepreneur operating system, I think? The entrepreneur um, operating system, yeah, EOS, yeah. 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 So, um, Catherine, wait. this is a comment from Kurt, I think. Yeah, so basically was, why do business owners even have to go back and fix anything? Why are they skipping the steps? And what is it? Is it a get rich scheme? Is that they're just hoping to get rich and they're just ignoring all the rest of the stuff? Like for me, it would be just, I want to go get do the stuff I want to do and I ignore the other stuff. But what do you think it is? Why? Yeah, I, I, skipping I, the steps. The, the analogy I use in Fix This Next is like a hiker lost in the woods. Um, you, you hear stories over and over. Someone gets lost in the woods and they start going in these circles. Often they're found, if, if they're still living, thank God, they're found uh, you know, very short distance from the way out. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, many cases are not found. And, and what happens for business owners is we walk in a very, very similar circuitous pattern. I call it the pattern of the apparent. Right now, any of us, we can go and email and there's I don't know, half a do there, there's probably two dozen, three dozen things waiting for us to address. The next thing that we put significance in, we will put urgency on and it'll take us away from what the business needs. So what we're doing is placating something that satisfies us. Oh, I got another task done. That's the thing I needed to do. Mm -hmm. But what we need to do or what gives us satisfaction isn't necessarily what will serve the business. We have to realize it's a separate entity. And the, the danger is like for self-preservation, there's a thing called Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Our sense is triggered off. If, if the three of us were doing this live, and we say, hey, afterwards, let's go for a beer. And we walk down a dark alley and something doesn't feel right. We should turn around. That, that's our senses triggering. There's something wrong. And we'll probably experience some kind of harm. Turn around. Well, we are physically, neurologically wired into ourselves. We're not wired into our business, but we treat it like we are. We say, huh, I feel, I feel I need to run those Facebook ads because everyone else says, oh, that'll change it. Oh, Clubhouse, <laughs> that's the scene to grow my architectural business. And there's no data behind that. It, it, and our senses aren't triggered into our business. What I explain and fix this next is that a business is, is a chain of events. And maybe they're not literally connected, maybe it's connected like a web. But just like a chain, a very simple illustration, if, if we try to make a chain stronger and we're pulling on it, if we try to fix all the links, it won't make the chain stronger until we fix only one link, the weakest one, because it'll always break there. And yet most entrepreneurs are like, I'm fixing everything, but nothing's working. Because the reason is they're fixing all the links without first evaluating what the chain actually needs. You fix that link, the entire chain is stronger, and now the next weakest link will present itself. And you resolve that, it's stronger, everything's resolved. In our business, we must find the link, and it's not instinctual to us. Go through a simple analysis. I, I explain and fix this next to hierarchy of needs. We look at sales, then profit, then efficiency, then ultimately impact and legacy. You look at these different elements, you identify the current weakest link, you resolve it, and then you go through the chain again and find the next weakest link. You know, that that strikes me as you're describing that. And I love the 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 uh, business hierarchy of needs as you explain it there and, and fix this next. Um 
but you were talking about the, the, the big rocks and the little rocks in the sand and, you know, entrepreneur operating system, um, you know, that conversation from just a minute ago. And as you were describing it, what strikes me is, you know, from my own experience, my own mistakes, uh, probably many times I'm not, I'm not, if the, the analogy of the weakest link is, is excellent, but if we tie it back to the, the rocks in the sand, I'm probably not trying to fix the big rocks. Right. I'm looking for the easy things. Oh, well, right. how do I get, how do we get 10 things done today? Yes. Perhaps. Um, and instead of taking care of the weakest link, I'm just taking care of the things that were easiest to, to knock off my list. Maybe. That's exactly it. There is an immediate reward and relief when we take care of all the little things. Check that one off my list. Yeah, In fact, your whole system is developed around this. Write down all your tasks, check one off, draw a line across it, and you're going to feel great. And it's absolutely true. But the question is, will it move the business forward oh. on a permanent business, business level? Will it up-level it completely? And for most businesses, no. The manifestation is week in, week out. It's like, gosh, it was happy I got to Friday, I put out a thousand fires, and then we come back to Monday and it's a thousand more fires. That is a business that has systemic problems. We need to fix something in, interior to the business, not these surface level issues that are presenting themselves. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. We are, um, for those of you that were not privy to our, our conversation in the green room, m this is Mike's eighth interview today. <laughs> um, he's, he's a, uh, I lose my voice a little bit. <laughs> no, not really. Okay, you sound good. great. Uh, he's, He's a Mike, Mike's a Mike warrior today. So um, we are going to uh, wrap this up here in just a couple of minutes with Mike. So if you have any last questions, you know, burning questions for Mike, make sure you get them up into the uh, comment sections here really quickly. Maybe um, we can do some rapid, rapid uh, fire answers. Have you got, if you've got some, let's do it. Yeah. Okay. So how far down do you have to niche? How far do you have to niche down to get to the next level? Like where they're saying residential architecture is not enough. Do you have to be like craftsman style only or what? Yeah. Niche down to the level where you are seeing, seen as the singular person with the greatest expertise. Craftsman style is not narrow enough. Craftsman style just for the, uh, the Jewish community in Pittsburgh, it may be too narrow, like, yeah. we're, but with somewhere in between that. Okay. All right. So that was a good one. And then someone else wanted to know where, where was it? Where was it? Oh God, it was really far back. <laughs> All right. Talk amongst yourselves. Hold on. I'm going to find it here. There was, um, well, while, while you're, while you're looking for the next one, I know you've got a new book coming out. Yeah. It's called different is better coming out yeah. in September, I believe, or, uh, expected out anyway. Tell me about it. Tell me about different is better. Awesome. And, and if, if I may, I'd like to make a bold ask and offer to the, to the live community. So the, the book is this, it is, uh, I studied marketing and what I found, particularly with this COVID pandemic, that many businesses need to remarket, meaning market in a new, fresh way. Yeah. We have to get the essence of what's effective. I've boiled it down to there's a fundamental framework we need to use to make our marketing successful. I call it the DAD framework. It's an acronym, D-A-D. And you can use a simple mnemonic. Any marketing you look at or you consider going forward, simply say, does DAD approve? Here's the mnemonic. D stands for differentiate. If you do the same as everyone else, you are invisible. What do you do that's distinct? It guarantees attention. But with attention, you then have to do the next stage. The A in dad stands for attract. It, mm -hmm. Listen, I could dress like a clown and I'll get noticed. But if I'm an attorney, I dress like a clown, I'll get noticed. But that kind of repels clients who are pretty serious about their case. Mm -hmm. So it must, must be secondarily attractive. What can I do that differentiates and then draws in the right type of prospect? And the third and final element, the next D, is direct. We must, once we have attention and we're compelling, we must compel the uh, the audience, the prospect, to take a specific action. Thing is, the action must be reasonable. I can't say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, check out my car ad. Uh, give me a fifty thousand dollar deposit right now. We can discuss buying your car. Like what? No, I can say, hey, here's the car I have. Um, give me your contact information and I can give you the five cars that I think are the best fit for you or something. It has to be reasonable. But the key is don't make it so small that you're not progressing toward the sale. So it's kind of a Goldilocks situation here. Reasonable to the prospect, but also reasonable to yourself. It's the dad model. Now, is it okay if I do the unreasonable ask or? 
Yes, whatever. Yes, yes, please yeah. do. <laughs> so here, here's my, and this is in the moment, so this is going to be a little bit sloppy, but uh, it just became available for pre-order on Amazon. If you listening in live right now, put, first of all, put on your 3D glasses for that effect, yeah, right? I feel That's like a you're bonus. just talking right to me here, Mike. I'm talking right I'm to like, you. Yeah. yeah. If you're willing to go on Amazon right now in this moment and pre-order, it's probably listed for like $28 or something. When the book actually ships, you'll get the discounted price. Email me. That's the key. And my name's on the on the book. It's Mike at MikeMcCallowitz.com. So last steps here. Go to is Amazon. Type in different is better. Mm-hmm. The book that I wrote is by Mike McCallowitz. And you can email me, Mike at MikeMcCallowitz.com. Just put, uh, got your book, Mike, or something. I got your book, Mike. I will send you the lost chapter. It, it was funny. I'm just going through final edits. And my editor, my publisher, removed one final section. I had to agree to it. But they killed a baby here. They killed a baby. It's a way to measure how to price out at what point you should be advertising, what what expenditure is reasonable and appropriate. I will send that to you in a PDF form. But you, you got to get the book. And it's on the honor system. You don't have to send me this their stupid receipt or anything. Go to Amazon or pre-order a copy of the book. Selfishly, this serves me in a big way because the Amazon engine will start uh, marketing to other people. So it will serve me. So thank you if you do it. And then I want to reward you. Just email me, mike at mikemichalowitz.com. And I'll send you that free killed section. And, and that's uh, that's on the screen right now. Mike at MikeMcCallowitz.com. I think I spelled it right. Um, so yeah, so it's on the book out. itself. Yeah, check that out. I, um, I I love the DAD acronym, you know, in the way that... Uh, Any format. The, yeah. Um, th- this is coming from the guy who's, whose tagline is relevance is greater than difference and empathy trumps everything. Um, that would be you, you know, Jeff. The, uh, yeah, that would be yeah. me. The, the idea of dressing like a clown is the, is the great, uh, the great example because I have a lot of people that I work with that say, Oh, we're going to, we're going to be different than anybody else. Well, that's great. You can be different. You can dress like a clown, but you know, what yeah, different, if different sake, and, and this is what I just want to acknowledge one user. Yeah, you can order Kindle or hardcover, Audible, whatever you want. It, it really does serve me. Thank you for doing that, by the way. You're serving me, and I promise I'll serve you. you. You can dress like a clown, and you will get noticed, but it may be the wrong attention. But I'll tell you this. You can dress like a nerd with the tape on the glasses and the flood pants, and you can become a billion-dollar business because that's what Geek Squad did. I, I had my computer business, and I'm you know, I'm wearing the, the scarecrow oversized suit because... <laughs> I thought that was what you're supposed to dress as and try and be super professional with all my credentials. And in comes a geek from Geek Squad dressed to me like a clown. But to the customer, that was no clown. Right. I want a geek saving my day. It was funny. It was attention grabbing. And sure enough, that is the superhero in the technology industry. Stephen Roberts grew that business and sold it to uh, Best Buy. It's a billion dollar plus corporation now. Me, I sold to private equity and it wasn't a billion dollars. It wasn't. <laughs> a billion. That's a billion dollar guitar over there on your wall. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, someone yeah. just got one. Facebook user, you are awesome. Thank you for getting a copy. I see that. I would do it right now, but it yeah. seems kind of not the time. Yeah. Right. Well, I should wait until we're off the you air. You can do it later. Do you have any more uh, rapid fire questions? No, you know, and before I had the rapid fire questions, I should have had them ahead of time. So next, okay. next time I will have them ahead of time. Uh, there okay. was one other question. Like if you're the weak link, what do you do then? work on yourself, I guess, right? Oh, if you're the weak link, yeah, it, it is about replacing yourself. Um, but we ask ourselves, why are we the weak link? Right. Meaning, are we just inefficient in getting jobs done? Or are we a micromanager? We're actually interfering with others. So get to the why you are. And we, yes, we have to resolve that. Mm. But some people say, I simply need to replace myself. And that's the mistake because they don't understand why they need to replace themselves. Right. Oh, that's a good point. That's a really good point. That's a great way to uh, wrap this up, um, Mike. We're gonna we're gonna say thank you to you. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for your time Thanks. and your books. I um, a, I a lot of the community just just chuckles when I bring up another book because I, I'm just I'm absorbing them. But uh, I appreciate you and your books and and just your ability to to boil these things down to the essence and, and build a system up on top of it, that. So thank you. Thank you for being with us. Um, we're going to let you go, and then we're going to wrap it up with these folks and and give them the last word and and uh, have a little chatter amongst ourselves. So thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, weather the snowstorm well, and uh, we'll talk again soon. 
Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jeff. I, I will dig into a uh, Taylor ham, egg, and cheese in your absence. That's what New Jersey <laughs> does. Be well. You All too. Right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. All right, everybody. Thank you for uh, hanging with us there. I think that was a great conversation. And what we're trying to do now, obviously, we're, we continue to evolve the format of these uh, conversations here, these live conversations on Thursday. So we want to get back to, um, to you. What thoughts do you have on that conversation? What questions? Um, this is this is a great time where we can break it down amongst ourselves um, and and not take up not only not take up any more of Mike's time, but uh, also you know feel free to say something that you might not have uh, wanted to say or you might have been afraid to ask. So that's yeah. the purpose of this last segment of this conversation here. Um, as you're thinking about that, the uh, to give you a heads up for tomorrow. Again, I'll be back as usual, same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow inside the Entre Architect Facebook group, our Entre Architect Community Facebook group. And our topic for tomorrow, uh, we'll be going back to our mini series that we've been touching on every week on digital and social media platforms for architects. We'll talk about LinkedIn for architects tomorrow. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're someone that says, Hey, uh, my, uh, my clients aren't on LinkedIn. First question I have is, I bet they are. are. Sure? I bet they are. I Everybody's they on are. LinkedIn who has a job. I feel like yeah, I bet and they're there. That's your client. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about LinkedIn tomorrow. Well, are I your don't... clients there? Are they not? Are the right people that you need to connect with there? Are they not? Be what are best plan, practices? though, Jeff, like you're Mr. LinkedIn, I feel like, cause you're like button down, business guy. And I feel like people on LinkedIn, I don't feel like I can say any, I feel like I'm just, what am I going to say on LinkedIn? It's like all people are interested in business and I'm just an architect. Well, you know, wears clown outfits sometimes, I guess. Well, I guess you could, that could become your, your brand, I suppose, if you wanted to wear clown outfits. I don't want to, but that's what I feel like when I'm on LinkedIn. So I'm going to have to tune in tomorrow. But about today, can I just say that I feel like, um, you know, next time I have (laughs) my rapid question, period. What I should do is collect questions from people ahead of time. Since you say what the, that could be my time for, for the rapid, you know, for the questions. So next time, if people have questions ahead of time, that, that would, might be a time for it. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, and like we've said all along, we're, we will continue to evolve this, this uh, format and we'll get better at it. And, and, um, uh, oh, I, I guess I also ought to announce that our guest for next week, for any of you that, are not part of the Entree Architect Community Facebook group, you may not have the opportunity to hear this. So um, our guest for next week in this format, so next Thursday, will be Seth Godin. So um, mark that on your calendar and uh, join us again next Thursday for Seth Godin. Jefferson, hi Jefferson. Jefferson says uh, that he loves the DAD acronym. So that, uh, I, I love that as well. And I love the way he explained that out. That's. Um, uh, I was wondering about, um, you know, what different is better was going to be about. And I uh, love the way he explained out that dad acronym there. Um, <laughs> someone, someone wants to add a floating heart emoji. I'll take them. I'll take know. them. Yeah. yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah. That, that's, well, that might be easier if you go over to LinkedIn, you can hit the, the, uh, that emoji, I think, and it floats up on the screen. It's fun. Well, one of my big takeaways from the conversation was, as I was reading his books, I was, had been wondering, as a sole proprietor, how does this really apply to me 100%? So that mm-hmm. was good to hear that um, you're thinking about my vendors and other people that I work with or pay as being yeah. part of my team. It was interesting to think of it that way. Yeah, that was that was a really good point. You know, I hadn't, I don't know that I'd ever even really considered it that way, but that was a good point. And one of the things, too, for those of you that may not have read the books yet, um, because this is something that I've struggled with a little bit, right? Well, this idea of profit first and, uh, somebody will say, oh, well, I, it, it, it shouldn't be all about the money. Well, that's not the point of profit first. <laughs> it's not profit above anything. Um, that's not the point of that. And fix this next is not just a straight ahead. Here's how you fix your business book. It's more of how do you diagnose and then where do you go from there? Um, so I think that's interesting about about Mike's books as well as 
um, there, there's a lot more to it than you might find, um, you know, just, just reading the title or the subtitle perhaps. Yeah. Does dad approve? Yep. Um, I like listening to his audio books because just the way he delivers it and he has these asides Mm -hmm. that I feel like aren't really written in the book, but I can't, I don't know for sure because I'm listening, you know, but so it's like more of a conversation with him. So I I enjoy his books. Yeah. And that's, that's how I consume books as well. Uh, audible all the time. I listen to them when I walk and you know, the uh, other things used to when I traveled. Um, and I, I really appreciate the books that are read. They're narrated by the author because many times you do, um, have that advantage of getting the asides and, you know, some, some of the authors call them little, little side trips and some of them call, call it bonuses and things like that. But, uh, I, I like that about Mike and, and, uh, him reading his own books as well. I agree with that. Yeah. So they're worth a a listen for sure. They definitely are. Uh, and for all of you East guys, I'm, I'm scrolling through the comments now and I see a lot of, a lot of Jersey, uh, Jersey comments. Mike is definitely uh, a Jersey guy and proud of it. Uh, Manny. Oh, Manny says, congrats to Evgenia Watts for getting her license. Congratulations, Evgenia. That's a big yeah. milestone. Celebrate that. That is, that is excellent. Um, I see a, a um, comment here from a while back uh, in this conversation today, Brian McCartney over on LinkedIn. Hi, Brian. Brian says architects are reluctant to specialize because they think it will limit the projects they get, but it actually can bring better projects and clients who see you as the expert. And that's, yeah. that's exactly the point, right? It's, uh, I talked about this a little bit yesterday. For those of you who maybe haven't been following along, maybe you're not a, a member of the uh, Entree Architect community uh, Facebook group, we've had this theme going with context and clarity this week uh, that, that kind of goes like uh, finding yourself as an architect. We talked about niches, niches. I've got to be careful saying it that way based I think on... You should just pick one. I think you should just pick one and go with it because I yeah, think either one is right. Okay. I'm going to go with niche. Okay. Why not? Um, that That's one of the you know, when we were talking about niches yesterday and a niche is a focus, right? It might be a project type. It might be a client type. It might, whatever it is, it's something that helps you focus and leads to that specialization that Brian's talking about and that Mike was talking about earlier. And I think, um, again, I, I, I say this quite a bit. I know a lot of you've heard me say this. It boggles my mind when someone says, um, Hey, we're architectural generalist. Um, with without any other qualifiers, uh, there there are a lot of people I've talked to that are proud of being architectural generalists, and it, it just yeah. you know um, that 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 really puts yourself in a tight spot if if that's going to be your approach. Right. I interviewed good- someone um, recently who actually she only does mid century um, ranch houses. Okay. Right. But she said there were 15 million of them built or something like that. So it's not Mm -hmm. like that narrows her focus, but she's the person that people from all over go to. So it's not just her city, but it's states all around her, people contacting her for advice on that building type. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. That's a great example. You know, think about, again, back to, back to branding, right? I'll put the branding guy hat back on for a minute and go and repeat the, um, Repeat the quote. It's often attributed to uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, Marty Newmeyer, who's kind of the godfather of modern brands. Um, he says almost the exact same thing, but they say that your brand is what other people say about you when you're not in the room. So, what's your brand as an architect? If if you're the if you're the woman architect that um, only works on mid-century ranches, it's pretty easy to think about what somebody might say about you when you're not in the room. Hey, this this woman is fantastic at dealing with these mid-century ranches. Yeah. But if you are the architectural generalist, what the heck is somebody going to say? You're a nice person, maybe? 
Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> well, people do. I mean, people were pointing out yesterday and again today, they're saying that the rural, if you're just a, I can't even say it. It's like rural juror from uh, 30 Rock, but rural architect. If you're one of those, then I guess you do have to kind of be, you just be able to do whatever. But it, it, like, as I was saying yesterday, there are like 4,000 architects in the Boston area. So yeah. in my situation, it doesn't really make that much sense just to do everything. Yeah. Well, and Sorry. and I think, you know, like we talked about yesterday, uh, I'm guessing that might be Heather that said I'm the specialist in rural places. Mm -hmm. The, that, that can be the niche, right? I'm the, I'm the one person that focuses just on these people, right? Just yeah. on so this county, this community, whatever it is. Right. So um, someone pointed out that uh, riches are in the niches is a quote. So either that would prove that that would be the way to pronounce it. otherwise it would be riches are in the niches which isn't right right so that is an excellent go. point there you go i solved mm. the question um and it's better anyway. than getting stitches yep <laughs> much better yep <laughs> so um anyway to me to me reading that book fix it fix this next it gets a little overwhelming mm -hmm. sometimes because um as i previously said it made me feel like um i really have no business being in business if i'm reading this book and just getting stressed out, even, even reading it. But, um, you know, there's always something to fix. And then when you fix that thing, you're stronger and you go fix the next thing and you're stronger. And so that's kind of encouraging. I like that idea of improving all the time. You, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that's what we're after, right? I mean, it, yeah. that's what I wanted to get to with that question, that first question for Mike, because I think a lot of people can go, oh my gosh, this is the guy that, wrote the profit book and the fix book and the, the pumpkin book and, you know, whatever, uh, you know, there's this perception of this expert because he's written these books. And um, the part of that answer that I didn't expect was him saying, Hey, I've just been writing books because these are the things that I wasn't good at and I needed to figure out. So I really appreciate that. And if you, if, if you have the opportunity and it's, it's, it's in uh, fix this next at the beginning of fix this next, it comes up in interviews uh, and other podcasts and things as well. He talks about his history as an entrepreneur and some of the intense failures and, and the, uh, the yeah. debt and, and all of these things, you know, he's, his he's not unlike his piggy bank and everything. Yeah. Right. He has, he's yeah. no stranger to um, yeah. That, the bad moments. Right. Right. So, yeah. you know, I, th I think it can be intimidating. Oh my gosh, he's written these books, but he's written them because he's coming from this place of experience. And I understand the idea of, especially of fix this next, of it being overwhelming. Um, it's one of those types of books that I like for the reason that it's, it's almost a handbook, right? It's, it's, it's a book that it may not be so easy to read just to sit down and, and read it all the way through, but it's so, um, it's so actionable that once you understand the concept, now it's a workbook, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'm going to go through this process to figure out what I need to fix. And then I'm going to put this system in place to fix that. And then I'm going to come back. Oh, right. What's next? And then yeah, the next system. It's nice to have that guidance to say, do this, then consider this. And then, so yeah, yeah. I found his books yeah. helpful. And I think he's, a, he's, um, yeah, he's an approachable, approachable guy. Uh Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, it's like a it, nightmare. I tried to turn my phone off. It didn't work. Oh, that's all right. I didn't even hear it. Um, uh, you didn't hear it. What, while Catherine is taking this important phone call, <laughs> Okay, so that's, that's my daughter who's going to call me a million times until I answer it, but hopefully she won't. She's supposed to bring you your tea, by the way. Oh, um, working at home, so fun. <laughs> happy COVID. Um, again, next week, our guest, next Thursday, same time, same format, next week we will have Seth Godin as our guest, and I've got an assignment for you, um, maybe a couple of assignments, actually, to prepare for that conversation next week. What instigated this um, uh, asking Seth to be our special guest was 
his podcast. He has a podcast called Akimbo, A-K-I-M-B-O. And I believe it was January 11th. The episode that came out January 11th is entitled The Architecture of Architecture. And Catherine and I might have a little bit different views on this particular mm -hmm. podcast episode. It's a short episode, something like 18 minutes long. Yeah, um, long. I want everybody to listen to that podcast episode before next week um, so that you can prepare for this conversation because it, it, it might be a little bit controversial, uh, to be honest, before we get there. Um, if you want bonus points for next week, uh, Seth Godin has been on Debbie Millman's Design Matters podcast, which is credited as, as being the longest running design focused podcast in the world, I guess. I don't know how you qualify that, but or quantify that. But so he's been on Debbie Millman's Design Matters podcast three times. They did a three part series together. So if you want to, really kind of get a feel for what the conversation might be like next week. Listen to the Akimbo podcast, the architecture of architecture bonus points. Listen to his conversations with Debbie Millman, who by the way, will be our guest uh, in April. I forget the date off the top of my head now, I think it's but um, I think it's April, April 1st. Fool's day. It's oh, wow. day. Does she, I, wonder she, going on. I wonder if she realizes that. Well, we'll Who's, who said yes to April fool's day. Anyway, it should be um, a holiday. Well, um, also, and you get extra, extra points if you read his book, Practice. Yes, absolutely. That is, uh, that is Seth's, Seth Godin's latest book published in 2020, I think just last year, probably mm -hmm. in the midst of everything that went on. Right. That's what he's talking um, to Debbie Millman about and on her. Um, right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, here's a question. Can you post links to both podcasts in Facebook? Yes, absolutely. I will. Um, so what I will do is um, Monday morning, I'll, I'll do the little announcement post. Hey, Seth Godin is going to be our guest on Thursday. So I'll, I'll have that post. And then in the comments, I'll put the links to uh, both of those podcasts as your homework assignment. So um, if you don't see them before, then you'll definitely see them by Monday. Um, and you can, um, you can prepare. And you know, what would be really great, and you will have my gratitude forever, is if you send if you do this homework, and then you send some questions for me to use during the rapid yeah. question round. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. Them, because that would be a good thing to do when you prepare. It is, there were a couple yeah. points in that book that I got a little mad, I think, at point 90 in the practice book. <laughs> Whenever he brings 90. up architects, I get a little a little sore. Well, but, you, know, you know, maybe it's just me. So it'd be good to know what other people think. Well, I think, yeah, I, I think it. Um, I, I think one of the challenges is he's an outsider, right? He's not an architect. Does he know all the ins and outs of the profession? No, not at all. I mean, and this is one of the reasons I want people to listen to the podcast as well, because I think I think you're going to listen to the podcast. And I'll, I mean, here, here's the honest truth. I've been a fan of Seth Godin for 15 years. Um, I read Purple Cow probably 15 years ago. Um, he's one of the business minds that I respect more than just about anybody. And I started listening to that, that podcast, the architecture of architecture podcast. And within five minutes, I wasn't liking Seth Godin so much. Uh, I think my prediction is that you're going to listen to the podcast and very early in the episode, you're going to say he's wrong. This is oversimplified. Um, he, d he doesn't know architecture, you know, whatever. You're, you probably will have a negative reaction. Well, but what I want you to do is keep listening because I, I think there is a turning point, and this may be where Catherine and I disagree a little bit. I, I will um, listen to it twice. I'll listen to it again and try to find that turning point, Jeff. I, I think when he segues from Levittown to HGTV, um, people really need to understand what he's talking about 
as he describes HGTV and its effect on the profession, its effect on the perception uh, from the general public, and what architects could potentially do to have a similar effect. Um, that that's yeah, he's an outsider, but I think it's really important for everybody to understand what the perception from the outside is, because at the end yeah. of the day, it doesn't matter what our perception is inside the prof profession unless I know. I we're know, hiring ourselves. It wasn't great. It wasn't great. Either you're a star architect or you're pretty much a loser. So that was the way I felt like, <laughs> I guess understand our suffering. You know, that's kind of the way I feel. But that's just the cold truth. Maybe that's true. We're either star architects or losers. I don't know. I'd rather I not that. think that, but I doubt I that. Know. I doubt that. I don't, I, I don't think so. No, I don't. I don't think so either. But so that, was that, anyway, that was my kind of my takeaway from that. Like, and that, right. and the part where he's talking about the, um, the McMansions. Oh, what are they called? The McMansions and saying, yeah, I just don't, I still, I do not believe that architects design those. So, and that they just have no control. Even me with my, my clients who always drive the bus instead of me, even me, I feel like I could steer them away from some of those things. So I just feel like maybe it really wasn't an architect and people think it was. But anyway, I guess I'll just ask him that next week. Or I won't. I'll behave myself. I will not. I will not. I'll try not to embarrass you, Jeff. <laughs> no, you won't embarrass me. I'm fine. I'm going to I'm gonna read it again and consider it carefully and okay. finish his book. And yeah. I'll be All right. Here. So there's a great setup for everybody else. Now you're going, what in the world is this? You got to listen to it. Um, yep. Give us questions so that uh, that we can do a rapid fire round with uh, with Seth Godin live yeah. next week. It's going to have to be really rapid too because he's not saying the whole time. But we get to talk about it after he leaves. Right, right. We'll right. have him we'll have Seth Godin for about 20 minutes and then we'll uh we'll wrap it up together like we did today. So, um again, still we're figuring the format out and um we'll uh, we'll keep tweaking it until we get it just right. And then something else will change. Oh, that's all right. It's all about change. That's right. All right, everybody. We really appreciate you. Appreciate you being here. All of your comments, um, <laughs> everything that you've poured into this. Lots, lots, and lots going on. Thank you for uh, being a part of this conversation today. Again, thanks to Mike Michalowicz, uh for uh, for having a really fun and interesting conversation with us today. And um, I'll be back again, like I said, same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern tomorrow afternoon inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group talking about LinkedIn for Architects. You can uh, look for the Context and Clarity podcast at 12.01 a.m. tomorrow morning with a review of today and a preview of tomorrow. You can join me on uh, Clubhouse, the Clubhouse app, at 9 a.m. tomorrow for a half hour coffee talk about. I see you more than my kids every day, Jeff. I just, it's like <laughs> your content is filling my life. I don't have quite so much time. I got so an hour at four, I got a half hour at nine o'clock. I yeah. got the podcast. There's, there's lots of way to consume context and clarity. There's lots of way to connect. Yeah. Um, I do love the the clubhouse conversation because I can hear directly from you in your voice. It's, it's kind of fun. It is nice to hear people's voices there. It is. It is. And then, of course, we'll be back 4 p.m. Uh, tomorrow inside the Facebook group. So until then, thank you to all of you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jeff. As Everybody. always, for hanging in there every single day with us. Well, it's this is uh, this is one thing I really enjoy. So thank you to all of you. Uh, take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Uh, if any of you are in Texas, uh, sorry. Get warm. I, I don't know. You know, it's uh, it's a tough time. I remember the blizzard of '78, and it really reminds me of of that. So, uh, please be safe, uh, be warm, be well, and um, hopefully you can take a little bit of time to relax and enjoy yourself, and come back again tomorrow, rejuvenated. So, with that, everybody, thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs>